Thank you all for joining us. My name is Dustin Saldariaga, and I'm a senior associate at Scott Legal PC. We're going to spend some time today talking about the EV2 National Interest Waiver, or NIW Green Card. This is an underutilized category, and it's one that we've actually started to see being used more and more often, especially among entrepreneurs. Today, we're very fortunate to have our firm's founder, Ian Scott, speak with us. Ian has significant experience preparing EB2 NIW petitions, and his personal experience navigating a number of U.S. visa options really does inform the way that we work with our clients and maintain a uh, client-centric approach. A few things before we get started. Our firm is a full-service immigration firm. Although we do focus on business visas, we also handle uh, family immigration as well as humanitarian immigration options. We will be continuing this webinar series. We do a number of webinars each month on a variety of topics. Uh, at the end of this webinar, we'll send you a link where you can sign up for those future webinars, as well as a link to our YouTube channel. We'll be posting this webinar as well as uh, our other past webinars to our YouTube channel. And we also post shorter videos on a range of immigration topics on our YouTube channel. Um, we try to put very high quality information on our channel, uh, of course, for free. And we, we hope that you'll take advantage of that and find it useful. We will also be sending you all a comprehensive guide on the National Interest Waiver, as well as the PowerPoint that you see on screen. If you have a question, please send it to us either through the chat box on Zoom or through the question and answer box. I'll be monitoring those and either we'll answer them immediately or save them for the end, depending on where we are in the presentation when we receive the question. Um, so uh, I will also um, be, as I mentioned, be making this recording available after this uh, presentation. This is being recorded, so please do be aware of that. Without further delay, I will pass it off to... Oh, Ian, are you there? I think you might be muted. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I was Thank muted. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dustin, and sure. uh, glad glad to be here. And you know, the national interest waiver category is definitely a category I think that is somewhat uh, somewhat underutilized. And I think that the reason for that is because um, a, a long time ago, uh, well, not that long, maybe before 2016, there was a standard that governed national interest waiver that made it a very, very difficult visa category to meet the requirements. And so you really saw people that were applying for this that were scientists, uh, if someone was creating a, a vaccine or something like that, they may, uh, they may have, they may apply under this category. But, um, but it, it really was a difficult category. And uh, so, so it wasn't utilized that much. But then what happened in 2016, there was a in December, there was a case, uh, the name of the case is Danisar, and that case was decided. And it really opened up the ability to use a national interest waiver, uh, in particular for entrepreneurs, but a lot of other categories categories as well, and really set out a standard that was uh, obtainable or achievable by, by many. So we do find that we're doing a lot of national interest waiver petitions. And the great thing about this particular um, category is that it is a green card category. So that's that's important for someone looking for a green card. It is a, it is it is a green card category. Now, before we get into the case that I was talking about, there is, a, you know, kind of a threshold requirement for the national interest waiver. Now, I said this was a green card and what it, it falls under the employment based green card category. And uh, the employment based or one, it, one of the, one of the employment based green card categories, and the employment based green card categories range from EB one through EB five. So this one happens to fall under EB two. Now EB two is further broken down in to national interest waiver, which we're going to talk about, but then also EB2, I'll call it EB2 regular, which is really when a company is sponsoring someone for a green card. So it's usually a professional, but someone's a company sponsoring someone for a green card. Now, the, the threshold requirements that I'm going to talk about are threshold requirements that apply for 
all, you know, both EB2 categories. So before anyone can even consider applying under EB2, they have to meet these particular threshold requirements. And the threshold requirements um, are either, and it's, these are all either or. So either an advanced degree or an equivalent or uh, exceptional ability. So let's talk about each of those three. So advanced degree means a master's degree or higher. So a master's, a PhD, and if you if you have a master's or PhD, and it doesn't have to be from the US, uh, it just has to be an equivalent degree to the US, but it doesn't have to be from the US. If you have a master's or PhD degree, then you can skip, you know, to the next step. You know, you pass, go, and you go go to the next uh, next step, and then we go straight into the national interest waiver requirements. But if you don't have a master's degree or or higher, then you can look to see if you have the equivalent, and the equivalent would be a bachelor's degree. Again, doesn't have to be from the US, but has to be the equivalent of a US bachelor's degree, plus five years of progressive work experience. So progressive work experience means that it can't just be the same job, like work experience that shows that you've been promoted and different things like that. So it's progressive work experience. So, so if you don't have a master's degree or a PhD, then you could still qualify um, under this uh, EB2 category. It's just the threshold requirement if you have a bachelor's degree plus five years of experience. Now, if you don't have either of those, so let's just say someone went to high school and uh, doesn't, you know, obviously if they just went to high school, they don't have a bachelor's degree so or a master's degree or a PhD, so they don't qualify for any of the uh, items that we talked about before, but they can still qualify under what's called exceptional ability. And this is not to be confused with extraordinary ability. There's an EB1 category of extraordinary ability, which lists a number of different extraordinary ability criteria, but this is exceptional ability to qualify under the EB2 category. And you'll see on the slide a list of a number of, I think there are seven items. And in order to qualify under exceptional ability, the individual would have to meet at least three. So, um, you know, three, three of these particular requirements. And I'm not going to read them out because they're listed on the slide, but, you know, but, but take, take a look. So it could be that someone doesn't have a bachelor's degree, doesn't have the five years of work experience, doesn't have a master's degree or PhD, but they could still qualify under the EB2 threshold requirement and then move to the, uh, the, the, the other uh, requirements. So, so this is what I describe as the easy part, the threshold threshold part is, is what I describe as the easy part. Um, and now if you if you do meet the threshold requirements, then you move into the last three uh, bullet points on this slide. And what they, these are, they are the national interest waiver requirements. I can't tell you how many uh, calls and consults people set up a consultation and they read the, the exceptional ability criteria or they see advanced degree and they say, hey, <clears throat> I have a PhD, so that means that I meet EB2. Can I apply for a green card? Or they go through the exceptional ability criteria and they say, hey, I meet three of these easily. Does that mean I qualify for a national interest waiver? But the answer is no. All it means is that you meet the threshold requirements so that you can now move to the three requirements that we're going to talk about. So these all come from that case that I talked about, matter of Danisar. And what they are is that you have to prove that the proposed endeavor, so whatever the person who wants the green card is coming to the United States to do, that it has substantial merit and national importance. So the first thing we do in a national interest waiver case is we um, sit down with the person and say, and ask them, what is it that you're coming to the United States to do? What What is your endeavor, right? And we formulate that endeavor, and then everything is driven from that endeavor, right? So that we, we, we clarify exactly what that is um, from the beginning, and then, uh, and then, you know, talk about it, talk about it in terms of, do we believe it has substantial merit? Why do they believe that it has substantial merit to national importance? And then go from there. So then, uh, you know, the, this, this first, this first prong of pro the proposed endeavor, that can really be formulated independent of an individual, right? So it can be, you know, what, what is, what is the proposed endeavor? You, you know, what, wh why is it that what this person plans on doing why is it important to the, uh, you know, to the United States, but not, not you know, you can think about it in terms of not specifically related to the person. But when you move into prong two, uh, the prong two is that the person is well positioned to advance the proposed endeavor. And I think an important thing to note here is the proposed endeavor means the endeavor that you talked about in prong one. So not any endeavor, it's that endeavor. So on the one hand, 
you have to propose an endeavor that is significant or grand enough so that it will rise to the level of national importance. But then you actually, in prong two, you have to show that you are able to actually accomplish it. And um, that's what well positioned to advance the endeavor means. And so what we do for that, the easy parts are looking at the person's educational background, their work experience, but the government often wants a lot more than that. They want to see that the, if it's a business, they want to see that the business is, is properly capitalized. They want to see that the company has contracts um, already in place. They want to see that the um, the the person is actually going to be able to do what they said. Now, the other big thing that uh, you know, the thing that's very important here, is track record. So they will often look to see has the person uh, done exactly what they're proposing to do here. Have they done that in their own country, or have they done it even in the United States if they were here on some other visa? And uh, that's going to be very very important as well. So so this uh, you know th this in terms of the you know kind of probably the number one reason that national interest waiver petitions are denied it's this prong too even though it sounds like a simple easy prong um, it's it's often the reason that uh, petitions are denied because the government doesn't believe that the endeavor is far enough along or that the individual will be able to advance the endeavor um, sufficiently and then the third prong is that the uh, you know really showing on balance that it would be beneficial to the United States to waive the job uh, labor certification process. So let me explain this a little bit. So the Congress has already said that. So when you look at the regular EB2 category that we talked about before, with that particular category, a company is required to show that they were unable to hire a qualified U.S. person before that person could be sponsored for a green card. Now, what Congress has said by making companies go through that labor certification process is that they've said that it is in their national interest to protect U.S. jobs. So that's why there is this labor certification process, and it's a very formal one. So what Danisar is saying is that you have to show or prove to the government that it, it's beneficial to the, for, uh, to the United States to waive the labor certification. And that's, what, that's why it's called a waiver, a national interest waiver. You're waiving the labor certification process that normally normally would be applicable under most employment-based categories, in particular EB2 and EB3. So what we do here is we tend to um, reiterate a lot of the things that we reiter that we have in prong one, why it's important to the United States. Then, then we move to prong two and we kind of talk about all of the benefits of this particular individual. So sometimes we might use the exceptional ability or the extraordinary ability criteria if the person's published many things. If they've, um, uh, you know, if, if they're all in all an extraordinary person, we might point to some of those things and say, hey, one of the reasons you should waive the labor certification is because this is somebody that you want in the United States, right? And then the other thing that we tend to do here is if the category is based on, um, you know, an entrepreneur, uh, then we tend to say that the particular individual, if they're an entrepreneur and they own 50% or more of the company, then they're actually not eligible for the labor certification process. So this particular prong becomes less applicable. And that is an argument that actually has been successful um, when, uh, you know, when applying for uh, when applying for this particular visa benefit. So. Perfect. And Ian, I do have some questions prepared sure, if you'd sure. like me to use those or if you'd prefer to wait for the audience, I'm happy to do that as well. Sure, sure, sure. No, go ahead. Yeah, please. Yeah, please go ahead. So could you say a little bit about what type of applicant, uh, you know, when you're doing a consultation or speaking with someone, what are the key things that you would hear them say that would make you think that NIW would be a good option for them? Sure. I think that um, I think that what you know when they're describing their endeavor, if they can point to, for example, government reports, like you know areas where the government has actually indicated that they feel that um, something is very important. Like so, we have some cybersecurity um, you know applications that we're working on, and people have been able to point to specific uh, government pronouncements um, or uh, announcements that indicate that they feel that this is 
an area that is that is important to them. So whenever you can point to something that the government has already indicated is important to them, then that's uh, you know that that's I think something that, uh, that, that 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 could work. I think that some of the other things like um, um, objective uh, objective uh, intellectual property, like for example, somebody has a particular patent and the patent office has actually granted the patent, and then we ask, well, why did the patent office grant the patent, and then what are other people saying about this particular patent, then those are things that help with prong one and prong two, because they, prong two, we're able to say that, well, they have a patent, so they, you know, someone, some objective in a group has already looked at this and granted the patent. But then also we um, would we'll be able to say that, uh, you know, maybe to get experts to write letters that say that, um, you know, this particular uh, patented uh, technology or patented idea is something that is beneficial to the, the, um, the, the U.S. And, and, you know, and, and, and explain why. The other thing that could be helpful is um, individuals who uh, can show that the, um, you know, their proposed endeavor is going to create a significant economic benefit to the the United States, right? So, if you um, if you have a you know a business plan, or or if you have a business that already has lots of employees, then it could be that that's an argument as well that we could use an argument that um, the endeavor is actually to create employment, and there are lots of. Uh, there's lots of documentation to suggest that the U.S. government is, um, you know, the U.S. government is. Um, uh, very keen on creating uh, jobs for U.S. U.S. workers. Perfect. And we did get a question come in. So um, in terms of the EB2 and IW being underutilized, I think when we say that we're, we're referring to entrepreneurs uh, using it and, and the Danisar decision and its impact. But uh, given that the Visa Bulletin shows a retrogression in the dates, um, Ian, would your opinion be that the EB2 and IW is still worth going forward in spite of the retrogression? Yeah, exactly. So I think I think definitely it, it is, and, and I think that that you know it definitely is an interesting point that the category is retrogressed now, but it normally isn't, right? And the other kind of thing to to keep in mind is there is no kind of national interest waiver retrogression, right? Like it's like you know the natural national interest. Just the, the I saw the question that the person asked is that that there there aren't statistics that indicate that um, you know. X number of people have filed national interest waiver petitions. They don't exist. It's because keep in mind that it's in the EB2 category. So EB2 is retrogressed, right? So EB2 is made up of national interest waiver and regular EB2 petitions. So it's uh, it's it's it, and they don't publish to, to my knowledge. They don't publish statistics that break out the um, number of petitions within that visa bulletin that are um, national interest waiver versus EB EB2 you know, EB2 regular. So, um, I, I, you know, I, th I still, I think it is a, I think it's still kind of, I'd say suffering from underutilization just because people still think it's a, you know, a really difficult category, but it has just gotten a lot better in the, uh, in the last, uh, in the last several years. Perfect. And could you say a bit more about what membership in a professional organization looks like and, and perhaps provide a, a couple examples? Well, I'd say that it's not, you know, membership in a professional, because this is getting at the um, one of the categories of exceptional, um, you know, exceptional ability. So usually it's something that goes beyond, um, you know, just paying a fee. Right, like paying, you know, pay, paying a fee and getting to 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 join, but um, but it could be, you know, for 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 example, like you know, and you know, one if you're asked, <laughs> like you know, extreme one, right, like if you. If you're asked to join the Oscar Academy, um, right, and uh, you, you know, or or if you are, um, uh, you know, in order to look, let's say that there was a, a, you know, kind of a gymnastics association, and in order to to kind of join this particular uh, group, you had to audition for it, and it was a competitive audition process. So usually, when we're looking at memberships in professional organizations, uh, you know, it's uh, in pro professional associations, we're looking for 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 a little bit more, but really for this particular category, we would we would include anything like so. For example, if you were uh, you know kind of a member of 
a CPA, um, you know, professional organization, if you were a member of a particular bar association, or, you know, we, we would include, include any, you know, any, anything that the, that the person had, um, because this particular standard is a little, little lighter, a little less than, because, because some of the things that you see here, you see in the EB1 extraordinary ability um, category as well. They're very similar membership and professional associations. But what I would say is that what we tend to see here is a little less scrutiny that's placed on these because definitely exceptional ability is less than extraordinary ability. <laughs> so. Great, thank you. And I accidentally skipped a couple no, no slides. Problem, no so problem. now we can move on to slide two, specifically talking about how the NIW can be used for entrepreneurs. Sure, absolutely. So, so I think that one of the, um, and, and I'll, I'll talk about these in kind of different, different order, but the, the kind of big, one of the great things about Danisar was that it specifically mentioned entrepreneurs. And I think that before Danisar, like entrepreneurs, we never really considered national interest waiver as a category that entrepreneurs would really look at. But I think that one of the, you know, one of the key things with Danisar is that within the third prong, we're often able to argue that the labor condition, um, labor certification is not applicable because the person would own, um, you know, would own over 50% of the company. So it's not applicable. The other thing with entrepreneurs is we can use as an argument um, for prong one that uh, the economic benefit, right? So um, we can say that uh, the, the the company is planning on hiring U.S. workers, and they use a specific example that um, you know it, it it can be limited even to a specific geographical area. Before, with the other cases that govern the rules for national interest waiver, the uh, they were required to provide an economic benefit or a, a, you know national importance across the entire United States. So. You, couldn't you couldn't you couldn't people wouldn't apply if they let's say were starting a consulting company in Idaho um, for, for for something if it wasn't going to have kind of the um, reach within the whole United States but Danisar uh, made it very clear that the uh, you know that this there isn't this kind of geographical limitation so you could for example um, provide uh, economic benefit to an economically depressed area and and just that one area and that is going to be in uh, something that the government considers of national importance so that's definitely something to um, to 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 keep in mind and. Uh, the, yeah, and then the other kind of thing, the third bullet point, it does, the Danisar does say that the plan venture does not need to ultimately succeed. There's kind of wording that we often use in petitions to, um, but you know, but I think that the, the bar is quite high for prong two in that, um, realistically speaking, the government does, if it is entrepreneurs, they want to see contracts, they want to see, you know, some at least some employment that's been created. They're they're going to focus on the business plan as well and in, in, in quite a bit of detail. Um, the uh, you know kind of kind of uh, and again this is somewhere where a track record is going to be very important to show that you've done this uh, in the past. So I think that those are some of the things that you would um, you would look at. Perfect, thank you, Ian. And as we're talking about entrepreneurs, do entrepreneurs need an established company to qualify for an NIW? They don't. They don't. We've done we've done NIW petitions for new companies. I think that what we tend to do more though is uh, entrepreneurs who are moving from E two visa to national interest waiver, so they do have a st an established company because it is going to be beneficial to your case to have contracts already, to have employees already. Um, you know, because we would include all of that for prong two, right? If we were saying how how well positioned is the person to advance the endeavor. We would include contracts. We would include tax returns. We would include payroll statements. If we were if we were making an argument that this was economic benefit was going to be the national interest waiver, so it definitely can be beneficial to your case to um, to you know to have that. Thank you. And I know a few questions have come in about the timing of applying for an EB two. So why don't we move on to that slide? And and at sure, the end, sure. I'll I'll share some of the the great questions that are rolling in. 
Perfect. Perfect. So in terms of timing for uh, for this, it, you know, th this changed recently, relatively recently, close to the end of 2022, this change. So and then there was another big change on February 1st related to timing. So the, let's talk about the petitions that uh, petition, the main petition that has to be filed for um, NIW and then the other petitions. So the first, the main petition is the I-140 petition. And this is the petition that basically says that you have met the three prongs that I talked about earlier. So this is the petition that has all of the supporting documentation related to that. Now, if you're in the United States, you can also file a petition, uh, which is an I-485 petition, if the category is current. So right now, the, we talked about earlier that this category is not actually current. It's not that delayed. It's, a, it's, it's a, you know, I think it's only delayed by um, several months. So it's not that delayed. But so it, you know, it, it could catch up and become current. But, um, but, uh, but, you know, you can only file that I-485 petition if the category is current. If not, you have to wait till the um, I-140 has been approved and then do con consular processing. Now, when you file the I-140, one great thing that happened starting February 1st of 2023 is that you can pay the government um, $2,500. That's what the fee currently is. I don't think it'll stay that, but you can pay them $2,500 to have the petition adjudicated in 45 days. So that's great because it was taking over a year to have these petitions adjudicated in the past. So that is, that is, that is, that is, you know, fantastic. Um, but then if it was approved, then you would know it was approved, but if you, you know, you'd still have to wait for um, the category to become current to either apply at a consulate or apply through USCIS to do an adjustment of status. Um, the, uh, you know, you, you definitely, when you're doing that, then you have to kind of, if you're in the United States, you have to, you know, make sure that you have valid status while you're here. So if you um, are filing an I-140 and you're in the U.S. on a TN, E1, E2, or some other visa, then you just have to make sure that that visa is going to last through the time frame that you're going to file the I-485 uh, and also that uh, you know, when you file the I-485, you can also file travel authorization and work authorization. And when you file that, that is going to take some time to be approved, like eight months or a year, maybe longer. So, um, so you just have to make sure that you're, you know, kind of looking at, um, looking at um, your ability to, uh, to stay in the United States. In terms of the pros and cons of adjusting status, like filing the I-485 versus consular processing, because even if you're in the United States and the category is in current, it could become current while you're here and you have a choice of doing that. Now, the the reason some of our clients still, even when the category was current, opted against filing the I-485 is because you do you are you are able to file the uh, work and travel authorization. However, the travel authorization, you need that approved unless you're on an H-1B or an L, you need that approved before you can leave the United States. So that's um you know that that's that's a really important thing to uh to, to keep in mind so if an individual you know can't stay in the united states for the eight <laughs> nine or a year without traveling, then they may opt to just consular process and then use the visa that they currently have. Let's say they're on an E2 to come and go. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that that's, that's, you know, that's kind of the consideration, you know, some of the things to consider when you're looking at um, whether or not you're going to adjust status or not. Perfect. And as I mentioned, we've, we've received a number of questions that this slide touches on. And I think I'll just preface, uh, before we dive into the questions, I'll just say that oftentimes the consultation is the best place to share the details of your circumstances. Some of these questions about uh, when you're currently on a non-immigrant visa and looking to adjust status, we really do need to dig into the details of how long you've been here, what status you're in. So uh, the email that we will send after the presentation will have a, a link to schedule a consultation. So I encourage you to do that uh, if, if you wanna share details of your circumstances. Uh, but Ian, one question gets at the heart of the difference between visa validity and status. Uh, so, so along those lines, can a PhD student I'll share the specifics, but but again, you know, really the difference between status and, and a visa. Can a PhD student with an expired visa and a valid I-20 file the I-140? Yes. Great. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So there, there's no, there's no. Um, the I140 doesn't offer you any status, or doesn't uh, like you can file an I140 if you whether if you're in the United States, you can file an I140 if you're outside of the United States. Um, it, you you can even file an I140 if you're not in the states lawfully, right? There, you may you may have difficulty getting a green card, but you you can file it. There's nothing, you know. So you're always able to file the I140. The rules with respect to inadmissibility come in when you're filing the I-485 or uh, applying for the um, consular processing, because then you look to see if the person is admissible, um, and uh, you know that that's going to you're going to going to look at that. But but the fact pattern, you know, the fact the, the the summary you just gave is just you know someone who doesn't have a valid visa, right? Because mm -hmm. the visa visa doesn't govern whether or not you're in the United States lawfully. Uh, what governs whether you're in the United States lawfully is uh, your status. And the status is going to be dictated in this case by, in the example that, that Dustin just gave, is by your I-20, and because um, you, you, you would have been admitted, the person would have been admitted on duration of status. And so as long as they continued going to school and, um, you know, had updated their I-20s, then re regardless of whether the visa is expired, they would still have valid status. Perfect. And another question gets at this idea of dual intent. Um, this uh, participant is saying they are in the U.S. on a TN visa working as a management consultant. However, they're interested in applying for the EB2 NIW. Um, what are what should they keep in mind in terms of the flags of possibly needing to maintain TN status, possibly extend TN status with a pending EB2 petition? Yeah, yeah, this is a question that comes up a, a lot. Uh, I think that when you're applying for any green card category, including the National Interest Waiver um, and filing an I-140, um, you have to be conscious of your underlying status. And in particular, if you, if during the pendency of the I-140 or the green card process that you have to actually renew your status. So TN is a great example because it's not a dual intent visa. And if you filed an I-140, you may have a very difficult time renewing your TN. Probably not a difficult time entering and exiting. Probably not, right? A difficult time entering and exiting, but probably a difficult time um, renewing it if you had to. So you, you do always have to pay attention to when you're filing particular petitions and what the wait time, you know, is, especially if you had an <laughs> approved, you know, 40, now you now there's not a long wait, right? You, you file an I-140 and you can have it approved in 45 days. And um, then you may have an approved I-140 with no ability to adjust status. And then even entering the U.S. at that point might be difficult because you're, you, you know, it, you are going to eventually get the ability to adjust status because the category is not that delayed. So I think that, but the main thing I'd say is to, to look at, you know, your underlying status and try to be in a position where you don't have to renew that underlying status during the pendency of the, the green card process. Thank you. And just a couple oh, more questions. Oh, just one, oh, one yeah. last thing. One last thing is just that when you're making the decision, like let's say that the category is current, right? E, let's say EB2, if, if EB2 were to be current, then the other kind of consideration is when you're filing the I-140 is, uh, you know, whether you have a strong case or not, right? Like sometimes people are in a bit of a hurry, right? Um, and the, because they, you know, their status is running out or they don't want to renew or whatever. And, um, but, you know, we would only file an I-485, like if the category was current, we would only file an I-485 with an I-140 if we felt that the case was a very strong case that was going to be approved. Um, and this may be less of an issue now because given it's only 45 days, we may always move now to just file the I-140 and wait till it's approved, right? But, but I think that... Um, the reason that we would do that is because when you file an I-140, you've sent a clear signal that you plan on adjusting status. If you file, sorry, if you file an I-485, you sent a clear signal that you plan on adjusting status. If you've just filed an I-140, you can always make the argument that, well, my plan was always to do consular processing, right? So that's something to keep in mind. Great. And just a couple additional questions while we're on this slide. The first, um, and, and you've you've already alluded to this, does filing the I-140 in the U.S. provide any status or benefits at all? No. And can you remain in the U.S. once you filed the I-140? No, no. Perfect. And and, and it, it is the I-485 that, that carries those benefits. Carries those benefits, yeah. We, we had a 
<laughs> I just forget it. <laughs> I was gonna, yeah. So, so no, the answer is a clear no. But we did have one situation where the person thought that um, us by merely having um, a start the application that that gave them the ability to stay in the U.S. But we had to explain to them that that's before we ever filed anything. But we had to explain to them that that's that was not the case. Yeah. Right. And in terms of family members, can they apply along with the main applicant? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you can for the because that family members are getting at the I-485 filing if you're doing an adjustment of status or the consular processing. So as long as the spouse and children under 21 can join in the green card process with um, with uh, the main applicant. Perfect. So let's go ahead and move on to updates on uh, for STEM uh, and entrepreneurs. Sure, actually, so this this is a, you know, STEM STEM specific guidance, the government had issued um, some, some, some pronouncements, basically saying that uh, they, uh, it isn't, you know, they feel that the people who are taking these particular uh, degrees, that, um, you know, they could be doing work that's in the national interest. So now when we do a, a, a national interest waiver petition, if the person does have a STEM degree, we, you know, utilize the pronouncements that were issued by the government to bolster their, uh, you know, bolster, bolster their case. Um, the, the, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of the other types of evidence that we, we get is, uh, you know, to the extent that, and some of these we talked about, to, to the extent that we can get documentation from the government, or uh, it doesn't even have to be from the government, it can be from media or, um, uh, you know, scientific journals or journals or other other things like that, um, that, uh, you know, kind of indicate that this particular activity is, uh, is, 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 is important to the US government. So I think that that's, um, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what we do. And then with the well positioned, I think the, the what's here is really what I talked about on the um, you know, on, on another slide, which is some of the things that we would, we would look at, but some of the things maybe I didn't mention, if, uh, if, if the person like, let's say the company was accepted into an incubator program, that's going to be very helpful, to the extent that the person's uh, received any kind of grants, uh, government grants, that's going to be helpful. We talked about intellectual property. Um, and, um, uh, you know, at, at contracts and things like that, those are all going to be useful in, uh, in, in assessing whether or not the person's well positioned to advance the endeavor. Great. And we, I think we can dive into, yeah, what's included in it. In yeah, perfect. Petition. Perfect. Yeah. So, so the, the, the petitions are quite extensive, right? So when we, we, you know, the government won't just take our word for it. So if we say that, you know, like the person has an advanced degree, then we, you know, we have to actually include copies of their degree in the, the report. So, and then if we, the petitions do get actually more uh, extensive if the person is qualifying for the threshold item under exceptional ability. So we actually do have to, like, you know, someone asked about memberships. Like if we said that they were, you know, in memberships, we would have to provide proof. If we were using the salary, like the person made a high salary, we'd have to provide evidence of their salary, but then also go to the Department of Labor and see what the Department of Labor thought the person's salary should be. Um, in terms of the other evidence that we, um, you know, kind of categories of evidence that we provide, one I'd call, almost call like uh, substantive evidence that is written by other people, whether it's government, journals, media, et cetera, substantial evidence that supports that the government feels that this is important, right? If there are articles in New York Times or Wall Street Journal or other academic journals, et cetera, that talk about the importance and sometimes it's obvious right like sometimes what what uh you know what what it, those are easier cases right when whatever the person's endeavor is that it's obvious that that's going to be of uh, national importance to 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 the government you know during covid someone that was working on a covid vaccine it's obvious that that's going to be of national importance to the the the, the us um but um but yeah but as much information uh you know relevant data documents that we can pull together is is going to be uh is going to to be is going to be really really useful. Um, the uh, other thing that we would want is um, you know documentation to show that the 
the person's well positioned, right? So we would want uh, a, a business plan that's going to, you know, clearly show what they plan on doing. But then any other um, objective evidence that they actually have advanced what they, you know, advanced their position. The other kind of big piece of evidence that we use in national interest waiver petitions are expert letters. So when we think of expert letters, it's always important to think of first, what do we need the letter for, right? So we might need an expert letter to prove prong one that this is not of national importance to the US government. So it could be an expert that is, um, you know, basically writing about the endeavor saying this is what the person set out to do. This I'm I you know, this is my background. And this is why it is important uh, to the US government. So someone an expert that's kind of um, bolstering that and saying that the, the, the and, and writing a letter that's saying this is this is this is important often you may have to pay for these experts or you know or but if you know people then certainly um you know if you know people certainly then they, then you could use them but they do have to be experts that uh, really are going to um, be experts in the particular field that you're talking about um, because the first parts of those letters typically uh, go through a fair amount of detail describing why it is that this particular person is an expert. Um, the other type of letter that we could use is if uh, we're writing a letter where a person is saying that the uh, explaining why the applicant is well positioned to advance the endeavor. So it could be somebody that the applicant has worked with in the past, and the and we're trying to explain that this person has a track record, and the uh, expert might be describing the person did X, Y, Z. So it is important when you're doing the expert letters to figure out, you know, what exactly is it that you want the expert to opine on. Um, if you're saying that job creation is a big piece of the national waiver petition, then the expert is going to be an economist. The expert is going to look at your um, business plan, look at your financial documents and say that um, as this company progresses, it's going to create both direct and indirect jobs of X number. So it would actually be an economist report that is pulled together. So, so definitely, um, you know, the, the expert opinion letter, letters form a, you know, a, a pretty significant basis for these particular petitions. And then we're obviously going to have the um, information like resume degrees, uh, because, you know, every, as I said, everything that we um, we, we indicate we have to prove. And then when we, we go to prong three, we often, also include um, anything that we can on exceptional ability, right? So, um, because we're, we're trying to say that this person is so exceptional that um, the or, exceptional or extraordinary ability, um, this person is so extraordinary that uh, we believe that you should give them a green card, even though there's this other overriding um, uh, concern about uh, taking work away from US workers. So, um, and then we talked about as well that uh, we would include contracts, letters of intent. Um, you know, if we say that the company is well capitalized, we provide proof that it's well capitalized. And the key thing to take away, I think, is that that anything that you're indicating, you're providing proof for. And and the one great thing about these petitions is there is no template for these petitions that Petitions really, um, there can be a number of different ways of pulling together a particular petition that um, you know that uh, that uh, you know you know that 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 works that that actually works. Yeah. Great. Uh, one one question: um, Is it appropriate to use old recommendation letters from uh, other visa applications for the NIW case? You can. I mean, if they're relevant, I think that I think, you know, sometimes people might have like an O1 visa, etc. But I think it's a great question in, in the sense of what I think is required, or you want to go back to see what is it the expert opinion letter is trying to prove. And then, um, like, so for example, it might be relevant for an O1, like, so, let's say someone had an O1 or, you know, O1 that they had approved, and there was an expert opinion letter talking about all the great things that this person did, then that might be be relevant for prong three right so so that you know it could be relevant to show like you know why is it that we should and maybe you won't have to maybe it wouldn't have to be modified right but it wouldn't it wouldn't be relevant for like i can't imagine it would be relevant for prong one right so so i think it's first to kind of say what is it that we want the letter for and then what does it say and then is it then you know then it might be possible to utilize the letter for that 
Perfect. And just to give a sense uh, to the audience, how long does it usually take an applicant to gather all the evidence that's needed for an NIW application? I think usually several months. The expert opinion letters take a long time. Like we, we do offer a service where we will draft letters, we gather information and draft them. But, but, you know, but a lot of the time clients will draft them and those take a long time. And because they're, you know, the client is drafting them on behalf of somebody else often. And then the person is reviewing them and signing them. Right. Um, um, so it's uh, it's it's th those often take a long time because there are multiple people that are involved. So. Great. And to take a step back uh, and, and to focus again on entrepreneurs, um, one of the lingering questions is what entrepreneurs can do to really strengthen their NIW case. So perhaps we can we can take a look at this uh, case study. Yeah, perfect. So this case study is a case study and, you know, an actual person that applied for a national interest waiver. Um, and what struck me about this case is that throughout the case, they often refer to, you know, the person starting a small consulting company. They say small many, many times in the, in the case, which I found fascinating. Now, this was a case that was submitted to USCIS and was denied. And then the person's lawyer sued and, um, you know, appealed really. And then uh, the appeals board looked at the case and said, well, yeah, we believe this case qualifies. And then they wrote an opinion and explained why it qualified. And this was an individual who was starting a small consulting company that was going to um, provide services to U.S. vets that came back to the U.S. after combat. And so in terms of proving that the, you know, the endeavor was substantial merit and national importance, submitted letters, newspaper articles. There's lot, lots in the media about, um, you know, this is an easy one, really, like lots in the media regarding why it is the government um, thinks that this is important, right? Um, I think that initially when it was denied, probably one of the issues had to do with the fact that it was a small company. And so when they said national importance, is it nationally important, like in terms of um, all over the US? Or is it nationally important for this, you know, the, the person didn't appear to be opening offices up in every state? But uh, the examiner said that that, you know, that that wasn't, um, uh, you know, that wasn't that wasn't required. And so there was lots of evidence with respect to, um, you know, what the problems that vets faced when they came back to the US and why it was important to, um, to, to try and assist them. So that was, uh, you know, that was that was well documented. And the appeals board said that, um, you know, that particular category was met. Under the, you know, the being well positioned to advance the proposed endeavor, the person had a business plan, they had the cap, the company was capitalized, they had um, letters of intent to, from from kind of agencies that said that they would, um, you know, deal with them so like emails from prospective clients. Um, and, uh, and the government said that that was sufficient in this case, um, and the person had specific background as well, that, um, that uh, showed that they were going to be able to advance this endeavor and the government said that this was sufficient. And then and for the third prong, um, they the government kind of went back to the whole idea of that this is a self-employed entrepreneur. And as a result of that, the, the third prong really wasn't that applicable. Now, we, didn't, we don't have the benefit of seeing the entire petition, right? But uh, we do, uh, you know, the, case, the, the, the appeals case decision is not that long for this particular case, but it, uh, you know, it went through and said that the applicant had actually met all of these criteria and then, you know, ended up reversing the USCIS um, decision and approving the case. Great. And Ian, we do have a few questions that have rolled in. And we're going through these. Um, I encourage our participants, if you have any other questions, feel free to send them in. Um, so Ian, I, I first, first of all, uh, a number of the questions are specific to um, the circumstances. So again, I just say, um, you know, if you are asking about your background, your specific degrees, would this qualify for an NIW, please do schedule a consultation with us so we can talk through that. Um, do you have Ian, uh, just, just general thoughts on when a professional organization can be categorized as being helpful for an NIW petition? Um, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure clear on the question. So, so the question is, can we categorize and then, then they list two specific organizations as a professional organization for purposes of the visa. And I'm wondering if we can just give more general guidance on, on, you know, if you, 
obviously not all professional associations uh, or organizations carry the same weight. So how do you think about the value of being a member of a professional organization for purposes of an NIW petition? Well, yeah, I see. So for the, and under the exceptional ability, um, card, yeah, well, I mean, I think that, that, that without kind of, you know, I, I think you'd include, like, let's say that, you know, let's say that the threshold issue was what was holding you up for NIW, you're going to include as much as you can with respect to the threshold issue. We have not seen, the fact is, to be honest with you, most national interest waiver petitions don't rely on extraordinary ability right that's 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 uh except for exceptional ability most don't most because the other two categories are not you know they're not they're bachelor's plus five or or m or you know a, a master's or phd um so even when people don't have the master's or phd most have either the bachelor's plus five but but we have argued in the alternative sometimes when people have um, degrees from other countries and it's not clear whether it's a three or four year degree. And so we say, well, they qualify here, but they also qualify just in case you don't accept that they also qualify under. So, I mean, you, you would just include whatever you had, right? So if you, if you, if, if that's, if you only met three of them and then uh, you know, you, you, you would include whatever, whatever it is that you have. I, I don't think you're going to find um, the, like an answer to kind of say that, this particular organization is is meets the criteria because it's it's like a subset of a subset of a criteria and um, I, I don't think that many NIW petitions hinge on that right like I I, I don't it's it's just not it's the the analysis like what I will say is it is a higher level much higher level analysis than the um, extraordinary ability EB one analysis so uh, you know I would just I would include all organizations that. Uh, you know, real organizations, professional organizations, and, um, you know, indicate why it is they are professional organizations, and then kind of go from go from there. Right. This application is an opportunity to really advocate for yourself. Exactly. It's not, it's not an opportunity, you know, it's not a time to really be humble um, yeah. and, and hold things back. You want to tell the government, here is every reason why you should, you should approve this petition. Um, now, Ian, uh, uh, you know, to go back to the discussion of dual intent, one option, if we had our example before of an individual who's on a TN considering an EB2 and IW, uh, one option is for them to change from a TN to a dual intent non-immigrant visa like an O visa. How do you think about that option? You know, for someone either to stick with a TN visa or a visa that does not allow dual intent or get one with dual intent and go for the green card. How do you think about that? Well, I think I think that it would um, it might depend on the strength of the case, but um, yeah, it might be depend on the strength of the case. Like you know, preparing an O one petition is quite an undertaking, right? So it's uh, <laughs> to you know to move to like you know it's not like getting an H one B, right? <laughs> where, where you just uh, so certainly if if something simple like getting an H one B and you get selected in the lottery, then you know have being on an H1B might be better better than being on a TN. But mm -hmm. I think that if you um if you have a strong case and uh you know and then you you have the strategy of just filing the I140 um and then seeing what you know how that comes out and then on the I140 form indicating that you plan on consular processing, I'm not sure that it's necessary to move to a um you know move to a, a dual intent visa uh, unless you know unless there's one that's readily available. Perfect. This question is, is, is interesting. Um, if you have a profession that normally requires a license, such as a lawyer, say, do they need to have been admitted as a lawyer in the United States? Well, I think it depends on what your endeavor is, right? So if your endeavor is something where you have to be a lawyer to be able to do it, then, um, then it's possible that well, then, then, then ha being an a being a being a lawyer that's able to practice in the United States would be beneficial. However, if being a lawyer that was able to practice in the United States just required you sitting for a 
you know, the New York bar, for example, then you could make the argument that you're still well positioned to do it because you could actually sit for the New York bar. So mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it, uh, you know, I think it just depends on you, what your endeavor is. If your endeavor is to be a, a, you know, to be a business person and start a business and create economic employment, then you're, you know, the, if, whether you're a lawyer, whether you can practice law in the United States or not is going to be irrelevant. Whereas if your endeavor is to represent, um, you know, people in front of the um, International Criminal Court, and that required some particular, and, you know, and then the argument was that the government found that important, and then that required some specific, specific license um, or accreditation, then, of course, it would be better to have that. Perfect. And then we, we have one more question. I, I do want to touch on it just just to give some general guidance. Uh, the question in general is if someone has unlawful presence, mm -hmm. does that automatically bar them from applying for an EB2 NIW petition? No. Okay, great. So you still have, have hope. Um, and, <laughs> and I think this is an example of one where we would definitely want to talk with you for uh, yeah. if, if you want to continue the process in a consultation. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, because because and just very, very generally on unlawful presence is that, um, you know, if you have under six months of unlawful presence, there's no statutory bar. Um, if you have over uh, six months, then that and be below a year, it's three year bar. And if you have over a year, it's 10 year bar. Both of those bars are waivable. Like you can submit a waiver for them. It's not that easy to get the waiver, um, but, uh, but, uh, but neither of them, e either, even those don't preclude applying. It's just, you wouldn't be able to get the green card with a, you know, with a bar. Perfect. And I think that covers everything. Ian, thank you Excellent. so much for taking the time and to oh, our thank participants. Thank you for the great questions. Uh, we do hope to see you on future webinars. Great. Thank you very much, Justin. Thanks, everyone. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye.